I want to finish this uh, uh, styles of violence, and I was just elaborated by one of your colleagues here. Uh, corporate bred violence, state bred violence, like state sponsored ter terrorism, the far more innocent people in the world are killed by state sponsored terrorism than criminal gangs or gangs of stateless terrorists. Nobody's whitewashing either side, but let's keep it in proportion and let me give you some examples. Thousands of innocent civilians, as he just said, uh, have lost their lives to uh, over, overarching, overreaching police brutality in this country. And once in a while it erupts, like in Ferguson, Missouri. But most of the time it doesn't erupt. There are some lawsuits that are brought and the police have to pay up, like uh, the way they mishandled the Republican National Convention protesters in New York. But it doesn't come out of their pockets. And it happens again and again. It's nice that there are damages in courts of law, but the, the other one is, and this is the myth we grew up in. I grew up in a myth where American soldiers don't kill civilians. Okay? All the bad guys do. The Germans, the Japanese, uh, the, the communists. Well, in World War II, there was a phrase in the military which was, you terrorize the civilian population in order to get them to rise up against their dictators. They, they, they used the word terrorize the civilian po population. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not military targets. They were civilian targets. And Japan was on its knees. We were not going to lose a million men going door to door in Yokohama and Osaka. Uh, it was a centralized country. If they got the emperor, everything else would surrender. They were ready to surrender. They were making uh, connections with uh, neutral people in Poland. Uh, the generals were against Truman uh, uh, dropping the bombs. General George Marshall, for example, five-star general. And uh, 400,000 people were incinerated. Civilians, children, men, women. Dresden, 80,000 dead. One fire bombing by British and U.S. Uh, airplanes. Deliberate fire bombing of civilian areas. Similar one was done on Tokyo. This idea, over a million Iraqis have died as a direct result of our invasion and occupation. Five million refugees. Iraq is the size of Texas, 26 million people. Five million refugees, disease, infant mortality, fantastic levels of cancer in Fallujah, for example, because we use chemical warfare, phosphorus bombs there. These are all war crimes. When you invade a country without constitutional obedience, that is, when the U.S. invades a country or wars against a country without the declaration of war, which is reserved exclusively to Congress by our founding fathers. They were very proud of that. They weren't going to let one man at that time in the White House plunge a nation into war. Everything in that war is a war crime. Every act by every colonel, general, soldier is a war crime. Israel has killed far more Palestinian civilians than the Palestinians have killed their occupiers and their invaders of innocent Israeli citizens. Right now, the casualty rate, the civilian casualty rate, is 400 to 1. That is, civilian deaths and injuries on the Palestinian side, 400 to 1 on the Israeli side. Nobody's asking for parity here. You're asking for prevention. You're asking for peace. You're asking for a two-state solution. But when Congress passes resolution after resolution, drafted to the last comma by AIPAC to support the slaughter of these Palestinians, blowing up homes and schools and UN facilities with pinpoint bombing, or so-called, and all the other atrocities. And uh, 
Gaza, which is twice the size of the District of Columbia, with 1.8 million people, very desert land mostly. And you can see that people have double standards. I like people who don't have double standards on violence. You oppose all violence. Doesn't matter where it comes from, doesn't matter whether it's on your side or not on your side. You oppose all violence. But most people exonerate styles of violence from people who they ally with. And of course, Congress is allied with the Israeli lobby, and it's allied with support the troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, 11 boys, schoolboys collecting firewood on a hillside in Afghanistan for their parents, vaporized by a missile. Sorry. That's no so sorry terrorism. Wedding parties blown up. How could you blow them up? You're supposed to have pinpoint bombing, radar, all kinds of surveillance. So, you know, things go wrong, as, as Secretary Rumsfeld once said. Stuff happens. Uh, yeah. And then their funeral is the next day. Yeah, and then they give them a couple thousand bucks. If they're lucky, they give them a couple thousand bucks. Uh, these things don't make headlines here. And when it comes to corporate violence, it's a, it's a particular kind of violence. It's, a, it's silent violence. It's the violence that gives you cancer. It's the violence that gives you respiratory disease. Sometimes it's traumatic violence, like the, the keychain problem in GM cars. I mean, boom, crash, trauma. But very often, it's the silent, cumulative violence of toxic chemicals, particulates, occupational disease, laboratory exposures, in drug companies and so on. So the, the, the approach is twofold. One is we put all preventable violence on the same plane of confrontation and action. And second, we elevate our sensitivity to silent violence as befits our intellect. Like we don't need much of an intellect to run away from a fire. That's almost primordial, right? You see a fire, you either run to put it out, or if it's too big, you call the fire department, you run away from it. You don't need to have a rational calculation. It's visceral. But modern industry and modern technology now requires you to have an intellectual awareness and sensitivity to these kinds of violence, because they have to be stopped by a political process of protest, elections, pressure, lobbying, internal whistleblowing and corporations, all kinds of, uh, of ways to get it done. Okay, one of the big forms of silent lobby violence was lead in your bodies. The lead in your bodies in the 40s, 50s, 60s uh, came from tetraethyl lead and gasoline and lead-based paint. How did it get in your bodies? Well, tetraethyl lead, which is put in gasoline to reduce knocking in the 20s. And when they did it, they raised gasoline prices. By the way, when they were forced to take it out 50 years later, they also raised gasoline <laughs> prices. Tetraethyl lead gets in your bodies by air pollution. And lead-based paint gets in your bodies if you're poor and black and Hispanic or poor white and you're four years old, you peel it off and eat it. There's a certain taste attraction from the walls. All right, so how did we get, of how did we get rid, rid of lead? It's now prohibited in paint, it's prohibited in gasoline, so on. And by the way, it's brain damage. It's not just the body. Uh, it affects the brain of young children, seriously. They've had studies on that. One, you started getting research connecting lead uh, to child brain damage, etc. Uh, medical journals, some people in medical schools, they're immediately attacked by the lead lobby. And I mean attacked. I mean not just hiring scientists to attack them, what we call corporate scientists, like they did in the tobacco industry, but attacked in terms of their, their job, in terms of their promotion, uh, harassed, investigated, spied on. One of the heroes was Professor Needleman, who Claire gave the Callaway Award for Moral Courage, Civic Courage, 
on the University of Pittsburgh. He was hounded. He was attacked. He lost his job. He ended up in Pittsburgh. But his studies were, taught, were, were told to be uh, scandalous and absurd and bad scholarship. Well, to make a long story short, he triumphed. He got some assistance in Congress. They couldn't break his studies. They were very careful. And the, pro uh, the process ended up happily. But you can see it was research, advocacy by the researcher, willing to testify, willing to write in popular literature. Public health groups started picking up on it. Consumer groups started picking up on it. Anti-poverty groups started picking up on it. Legislators started picking up on it. Started having hearings. The media started picking up. It was shown that lead was not needed. It was not needed in paint. There were substitutes, and it was definitely not needed in gasoline. So it shows that it was basically not a essential ingredient in an essential product like gasoline. And victory. Now, if you ask yourself, how many people pulled this off at the level of a thousand hours of work or volunteer? A thousand hours. You could fit them in this room. You see? Yes? Do you think the same thing could happen now? Or was, was that yes. Environment? Yes, the same thing can happen now. And it, it happened in asbestos. Now, in, in asbestos, there was litigation, much more than lead. Huge tort lawyer litigation. Now, who's most dumped on in the legal profession? The lawyers who challenge corporate crime and abuse and violence. Trial lawyers, not the corporate lawyers who are defending and promoting continuation of corporate crime, fraud, and abuse. See? So we are taught to hate tort litigation. The insurance companies and Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, and so on, and Rush Limbaugh, have now persuaded 70% of the American people to push, to, to uh, agree to tort reform, otherwise known as tort deform. In other words, take away your rights as wrongfully injured people from having your full day in court without damage caps and restriction on jury determination of facts and, and, and so forth. But the asbestos, which is continuing, asbestos is out of almost everything now. It only killed half a million Americans. That's all. Starting in the shipyards in World War II in particular, you come home with your overhauls, your spouse is washing the clothes, kids are around. These people got sick too. Asbestos is a fire preventer. There are other ways to do it. We're getting along without it. Yes? This may be a big question, so let me know if you want to yeah. Want to kick the can down the road. Um, if you accept for a moment the premise that the chemicals used in fracking cause cancer, yeah. damage our air, damage our water, if it you were your issue and you were to take it up today, how would you combat fracking to end the practice? Just the way it's done in New York State. You have Walter Hang out of Ithaca and people in Albany, uh, they put so much pressure on Cuomo, he kept delaying, he's delaying, he's delaying. And he's only delaying because of the pressure. You, then you go to the landowners who are trying to make a few bucks, you know, upstate New York's poor, and south New York's poor, and you say, let me see your contracts. These are rip-off contracts. Now the people in Pennsylvania are being ripped off on the royalties. They signed the fine print. And so you get them right there, that they've been cheated. You show them, you bring some people from Pennsylvania up who have turned against fracking. You show the effect on water. The effect on water is irreversible, and, it's, and, and that is slowing down fracking. The, the decline in price of oil is also going to slow down. If it keeps going, it's going to slow down uh, fracking. Uh, then you go into, into uh, what it does to the land when it's left behind. You know, fracking is short-term profit for the landowner, but then they're left behind. They want to water their garden. They're getting wells that are contaminated. And there's a lot more. Chemicals they use in the process are toxic in the process. Yeah. 
So like Walter Hang and others, he's the technical guy who's a tremendous driver uh, of power. He was with Nyperg, tremendous driver of power. He has his own little firm uh, where he tells you if you want to buy a house, he tells you what are the toxic areas in the neighborhood, you know, uh, so you can decide whether you want to live there or not. The same process, there's a regularity to the process. It starts with factual disclosure, then it attaches moral principles to it, then it gets people talking about it, then it gets a reporter here or a TV uh, commentator there. After a while, you, you learn so many case studies, you learn how to proceed, even if you start right, right at the beginning. Uh, it's beginning to be, cause low-level earthquakes. In Oklahoma, they're getting 3.2 level earthquakes. That now they have uh, agreed e that they are connected with deep, deep well uh, fracking. So if we keep at it, more and more states will abandon it. The problem is when the, the state lets it, he doesn't make, do the act, but the town has to do it. That, that's very labor intensive, you know, town by town. It's nice that the town can do it, but it would be better if the state did it across the board. Yes? Um, you can go look on the news pages of the Wall Street Journal and you'll find that Rex Tillerson is very outspoken with his neighbors who live outside of Dallas against fracking. And he has an interesting job. He's the chairman of the board of Exxon Mobil. So go look in the Wall Street Journal. It's been in the last year. On the news pages, not the op-ed page. Yeah. Rex Tillerson, you said? Rex Tillerson. Yeah. So if that doesn't give you some information, I don't know what that is. I guess right. it's good in somebody else's backyard. Right. Everybody else's. Uh, let, me, let me just give another example. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering, yeah, another example could be the cumulative violence of nuclear power and how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission can, nu um, the cumulative violence of nuclear power yes. and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission controlling the health and safety to support the industry as, a, as opposed to the public. And could you speak to that issue? Okay. When we came out against nuclear power in the early 70s, here was the projection by the Atomic Energy Commission. They don't like the word atomic energy, by the way. You want to really needle them. Oh, don't say nuclear power. Say atomic energy. It's now called the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They projected 1,000 nuclear plants in the U.S., 100 on the California coast. Here's what happened. There are now 97 operating, give or take. There's one left in California. They built four or five, and they've all been shut down. And this one's about to be shut down, Diablo Canyon, I think it is. Uh, and so California will have zero nuclear plants. Now, Indian Point's 30 miles north of Manhattan, aging two plants. One is already cut, shut down. There was three plants. Two plants aging near earthquake faults, a lot of bad mistakes being made. If there is a Fukushima-type accident, goodbye New York City. Now, why would, a, why would a society that was properly paranoid allow that kind of time bomb? That's why when you talk about 9-11, the, the hijackers were looking for political targets. And it's lucky they were looking for political targets because it minimized fatalities. They were looking for Congress, they were looking for the Pentagon, they were looking for the World Trade Center, because to them that was corporate imperialism, and Pentagon was military, and Congress was the enabler, and they never got to Congress, as it crashed in Pennsylvania. What if they hit Indian Point? What if they hit the pool of fuel rods stored in Indian Point? I mean, you could add two more zeros and then the, the casualties afterwards. This is a time bomb, and there are good people doing little DVDs. Two, quote, housewives are doing, did a good DVD in the area. One fellow got into a motorboat, and he, it's on the Hudson, and he drove all the way up 
twice, right to the shore, before a guard motorboat finally said, what are you doing? They're not guardable. So here's what we did. In 1973-74, we had, here's, here's the tool of citizen action. We had mass training convocations. By that I mean we brought people from all over the country, 1,000 of them, in a hotel with workshops and, you know, rooms, and we trained them to understand the perils of nuclear power, the regulatory capabilities that weren't used, the evacuation plans that nobody knew about that had to be stored in local libraries 10 miles around the plant, impossible. It can't evacuate around. Can't even ev evacuate at rush hour time. New York, you're going to evacuate New York. Um, and how to combat it. These people went back home. They formed, they formed the groups that on the civic level blocked nuclear power. The other force that blocked nuclear power was Wall Street because it was so expensive and so risky and so prone to shutdown and so inefficient. They've become more efficient now in terms of how many days they're operating that they wouldn't lend them money. So the combination of the inability to finance and such public disapproval that electric utility executives didn't want the headache. You know, they'd go to the country club and get static. They didn't want the headache. Much less than they couldn't get it financed. Now look at the, look at the power that was overcome. Nuclear power by law is protected in the following ways. It's uninsurable privately, so you the taxpayer insure it. It's called the Price-Anderson Act. Okay. It's unguardable in terms of national security, but that isn't enough to shut them down. So that's minimized. Number three, it's unsafe. They can't find a place to put the hot waste for 250,000 years or more. Never mind transporting it by truck and rail through communities and so forth. That's all right. Uh, that's approved. They don't keep them from operating because they can't store their waste. In other words, there's a whole cordon of immunity around these plants that allow them to keep operating allow them to keep, keep putting ads, you know, the Nuclear Energy Institute and the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, every day now, New York Times, big ad, A section, nuclear power is the savior, no greenhouse gases, it's efficient, it's there, it doesn't have peak, low, like wind, and so on. All the various myths like wind power, and solar power, have, you can't have a continuous stream, of course you can, they're working on that even without a grid network and so on. So you have... It's uninsurable, it's unfinanceable, it's unsafe, it's unnecessary. It, you know, that burning wood is almost as much energy now. The burning of wood in terms of BTUs. As nuclear power has never gotten more than 20% of the electricity in the country. Uh, we waste over 50, 60%. I mean, just efficiency replaces the need for nuclear power. When David Freeman, who ran the public utility in Sacramento, SMUD it's called, the Sacramento Municipal Utility, he shut down the nuclear plant and they hardly felt it. They just replaced it with efficiency and, and renewable. Just shut it down. Citizen Action shut down the Trojan plant in Oregon. They hardly felt anything. The, the only thing they're feeling is they have to pay to maintain this mausoleum of death until they break it up and cart it to who knows where. Huge, huge plant. Five people led the way to shut down that plant. Three of them lawyers. Five people. So, let me give you an example. Have any of you heard of PEER? Any of you heard of the group PEER? Here's what it stands for. Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility. Now, 
How many times do you hear politicians running for office in Washington, and what do they do? They dump on the civil service. The bureaucrats, right? They want to go lead the government, so the first thing they do before they get elected is they destroy the morale of the people who are operating the government, like Reagan. So we don't pay enough attention to the civil service. We don't ask them, how can they be protected when they're whistleblowers? Some people did. Therefore, we have two whistleblower protection laws. One was passed a year, more than a year ago by left-right legislators in Congress. They completely overpowered, it took three years, the corporate lobbyists, because corporate lobbyists do not want federal whistleblowers to be protected when they blow the whistle on corporate fraud on Medicare, corporate fraud on Medicaid, corporate fraud on government Pentagon contracts, corporate fraud on natural resource uh, grants and giveaways and so on, royalties. So there are a few forest specialists in Oregon, in the National Forest. They were told by the U.S. Forest Service to clear cut a certain area because Weyerhaeuser and others, you know, they pretty much control the U.S. Forest Service. Only 5% of all the timber harvested in the U.S. comes from the National Forest. So we could easily prohibit all cutting of trees other than for forest preservation. All commercial cutting of trees and preserve these great areas for recreational tourism and just serenity. How many of you have ever been next to a redwood and looked up, right? It's like an out-of-body experience. We've cut down 95% of the redwoods. So these foresters, they had an option. They could have quit. They could have surrendered and said, yes, sir, we will clear-cut thousands of acres against our professional judgment. Instead, they started this group, peer.org, you want to look at it, P-E-E-R.org. It has a Washington office, it has an office in Eugene. They probably have about 30 full-time people, and they are a real force in Washington. They litigate, they testify, they expose, they're into gas pipeline explosions, they're into not just forest issues, they're trying to sign up people uh, who work for EPA, people who work for OSHA, because um, that's an environmental responsibility. And when I talk to civil servants from the Pentagon and the Department of Transportation in Washington, you know, they have these renewable seminars where they bring them in to give them a week of open window thinking. And I say, how many of you have ever heard of PEER? Not one has ever raised their hand. So what you have are silos in the civil service. They don't know what each other is doing. So I said, look, why don't some of you, when you retire at age 55 or 60, start a website that connects civil servants across departments and agencies? DOT, Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture, Food and Drug Administration, Pentagon, Treasury, State Department, connects them so that you start diffusing best practices. You start extending civic courage. You start thinking about how to protect yourselves and preserve free speech and bring your conscience to work every day. And nobody's done that yet. But there's nothing stopping someone from starting a group like that. It's not that expensive. You can do it with a computer. You have to know a little bit about the civil servant service. But you start it small, and then it grows. We have the most trivial websites the world has ever conceived that have hundreds of thousands of people. So it isn't like nobody knows how to do it. It's just they don't know how to use their time properly. So I leave that for some of you. You know computer people, you're computer people yourselves, get it underway, right away. Connect with peer, they'll give you a lot of support. Connect with some other groups who are working in Washington to defend whistleblowers, people like, people blew the whistle on the NSA, 
great people, courageous people. And there's a group called GAP, which came out of our whistleblower protection conference in 1972. First one. It's called Government Accountability Project, GAP. Look it up, GAP.org. They have a bunch of lawyers who represent beleaguered and fired whistleblowers from the Meat and Poultry Inspection Unit, Department of Agriculture, NSA, and so on. Yes? Um, it sounds like um, a lot of these success stories are really professionals, lawyers. Yes. How can lay people connect better with, with those folks to get that type of support that we obviously need? I would say a majority of the whistleblowers are not professionals. Uh, they're people who work on the assembly line of GM and blew the whistle in St. Louis that led to 6.5 million GM cars being recalled. He was a lowly inspector in a GM plant in St. Louis. It's this famous engine mount, uh, which would accelerate you when you didn't want to. Uh, so the, a lot of the whistleblowers are, quote, very ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Uh, I would say that the, some of the intricate professionals are the worst. They have a, a good status. They have a good pay. Uh, they're very, very fearful of being blacklisted or being treated as pariahs. That's the case in genetic engineering world, for example. Yes? What's your take on Edward Snowden? We should have more of them. Yeah. He, uh, he basically, uh, he, he uncovered a pattern of criminal unconstitutional behavior. I mean, one of them was uh, spying on all Americans, you know, hustling all your emails and telephone calls into massive com computer data banks and deciding when they wanted to use it. I mean, and, and what happened is his attackers are the criminals. He exposed the criminals. And the criminals in government and elsewhere are the ones who are hounding him. Uh, you know, obviously it wasn't a cakewalk, was it, to do what he did? Uh, and Ron Paul said it very well. He said, we need more Edward Snowdens. You see, what happens, you can test a society's dominant ethos by who they honor. And the operative phrase is, you honor what you value. And we value sports and entertainment stars, therefore we honor them. Therefore, we know them by name. Uh, but the really serious heroes in our country who head off deadly this and deadly that and criminal behavior and billions of dollars of fraud, they are dishonored officially. And so that's why we need groups more like the Callaway Award for Moral Courage uh, on behalf of citizens who took risks in, uh, in blowing the whistle. I'll get to that when I'm going to ask you the following question that I want you to think about. Somebody says to you, you have one year, $15 billion, and 17 of the most rich and influential business and professional people in America. You have them, you have media, giants, you have legal giants, you have business giants who are enlightened. And they've decided to get together. And they decide to go to Maui and they rent a whole hotel because they don't want anybody to learn what they're planning. And led by someone like Warren Buffett, they say they're going to spend a year of their lives and it turns out $15 billion dollars to turn the country around, top down, bottom up, and leave enduring institutions behind. Okay, here's what I want you to think about, and we come back later. Somebody gives you $15 billion and 17 people who are willing to go all out with all their contacts for a year. How would you do it? And I have asked that question of college students. They are so drained by their educational disaster of any imagination that here, is where, here are the answers I got. I would spend $15 billion registering people to vote. I won't, I'll spare you the other. You see? 
total devoid of any imagination about social change mechanisms. And the weave and the tapestry and the scatter and the distribution of initiatives that reinforce each other. Now I want to give you another good story. When I became, quote, famous, I was on the cover of U.S. News and World Report and they had the top most influential people in America. And I was number four. It was the president, the head of the Federal Reserve, the head of the AFL-CIO, and little old me. <laughs> right? Me, the hitchhiker from Connecticut, who didn't have a dime to his name, going down to regulate the auto industry. <laughs> I once was picked up by a guy in Delaware, and I love to hitchhike, by the way. It was not a deprivation. It was a learning process because you had an audience. I kept, I, I kept quiet. I, I learned from the driver. The driver always had an expertise. They were an engineer. They were a bricklayer. They were a tree surgeon. I learned all about these things. My mother taught me. You learn when you, you listen. So he said, what are you doing? You know, I didn't look like a normal hitchhiker. Long hair, you know. I said, what, where, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Washington. He said, what, what are you going to Washington for? Well, I said, if you have to know, I'm going to Washington to get federal regulation of the auto industry for safety. He went like this. <laughs> I thought he was going to leave me off on the road. But one thing I learned at law school is how to deal with power. It doesn't mean all law students learn that. I just focused on that. Law disciplines power. The rule of law is designed to redistribute power, destroy unfair, abusive power, channel it in better directions. You know, and that's what the tension is all about in the rule of law. People are given due process, habeas corpus, information, so on. Access to justice. And so I went there, and I had a strategy. I knew where the levers were. I had to get reporters informed, lunch at a time. Some thought I was peddling an inv uh, a safety device for an inventor. <laughs> I went to Washington Post, and I picked out a guy who I thought would write on this. And later on, he told me that after I left the Post, he, he turned to his editor and he said, this guy's probably peddling some safety device. He could have gotten a Pulitzer Prize, but he was too jaded. So I got another reporter who turned out to be terrific, Morton Mintz. And he really stayed with the story in the Washington Post. But I also got others. Then I had to figure out in Congress, where do I start? Well, it turns out my senator was Senator Ribicoff in Connecticut, who made a name for himself in traffic safety in Connecticut. Not on cars or highways, but going after bad drivers and drunk drivers. And I got his subcommittee to start hearings. They didn't have the jurisdiction to do so in terms of legislation, just investigation. That got the envy of the Senate Commerce Committee, which was the legislative committee, and they took it away from them and passed what turned out to be the Motor Vehicle and Highway Safety Laws. But you do the same thing in the house. You learn to... St I lived up there. You go up there, contact the staff. Some of them went to your law school. Some of them went to your undergraduate, use the old college tie. Some of them are very fine people who want to get something done and not just be sycophants to their senatorial boss. And it, it was hard. Uh, one of the great champions who became head of the Federal Trade Commission uh, Mike Perchuk, he was a staff uh, staffer to Senator Magnuson. And he told me later that when I walked in and I said, I've got the goods on the tire industry, he thought I was crazy. He, he, he told me later he thought I was crazy. You're going to regulate the powerful tire industry? You're going to get this Congress, this, Cong this, this corporate indentured Congress, to regulate Goodyear, Firestone? Not a way. It was done. So 
So when I became famous, uh, I became the highest paid speaker in the world. How do I know? It was in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> I was paid $3,000. Now Hillary gets $250,000, and so does Bill and Greenspan. And I mean, it's now a joke, right? When you look back, 1969 or whatever, I was getting 3000 All right, so let's say that's 13000 today. People, crazy people are getting huge money. People who are on comedy shows, you know. Seth Meyer got $50,000 the other day from a university in Florida. You know Seth Meyer? Anybody know Seth Meyer? Okay, you, uh, just remember that. I'm, I'm going to make a very important point in a minute. He's on Saturday Night Live, I think. How many of you watch Saturday Night Live? Okay. okay. All right. So I said, what am I going to do with this money? I was getting like 100, 150 dates a year. It was keeping me from some of my work. But that was part of my work, was talking to students and faculty. So I, I put, put $500,000 to hire organizers to start the PERGs. How many of you heard of Mass PERG and New York PERG? Okay. The, the PERG is Public Interest Research Group. And it's funded by a tuition add-on of five bucks or six bucks per student or student government money. Utterly trivial, not even around the beer. And the money goes into a nonprofit group. The board of directors are students, and they hire people in their 20s and 30s who are lawyers, scientists, organizers, lobbyists. And they're all over the country now. There are probably 20 operating in Mass. It could be one of the most powerful citizen groups in Massachusetts. They've worked on drinking water, all kinds of consumer protection. Um, New York has got a $3 million budget. It's five offices, lobbying in, in Albany. It's gotten terrific bills through. It's uh, vastly improved in an offshoot group, the New York City subway system. Uh, Strap Hangers Group, it's called. Meticulously working day by day on the various subway lines and getting feedback. Prison reform, environmental issues, uh, protection of the elderly from hearing aid rackets in Albany, and some of the students got course credit for it. Uh, I would say the budget now for all these PERGs is on the order of $25 million a year. They have door-to-door -door canvassing, some of them. And then they have a national PERG, which just spun off its environmental unit that has 50 full-time people. And they have 30 or so full-time. They're a major environmental group now in Washington, among other involvements, especially in financial reform, in Wall Street and Dodd-Frank, major factors there. And they have a backup funding group called The Fund that helps them when they get into a little financial straits and they can't meet the budget. That has an endowment now of about $17 million. Okay, how did it start? Five hundred thousand bucks. How could I have spent the five hundred thousand bucks? Could have had regular trips to the Riviera. You need a little R and R, don't you? Citizen advocate. Could have put it in a savings account. A little bit of rainy day fund. In case I get sued by corporations, I can pay for the lawyers. That's the difference. You have to have a higher sense of your own significance. That's what students don't have today. Not even a fraction of them. They, they beg for little. In the 60s, there were a number of students who had a higher sense of their own significance. They fought the Vietnam War. They fought for student rights. They fought for civil rights. They put the environmental issue in 1970 on the map. Most of the workers for all those events were students before the subsequent participation in the five days later. That's what it comes down to. One person can make a difference 
That's accepted in American history. That's unassailable. The more difficult question is whether a lot of people together can get together to make a difference systemically. That's the hurdle. We've got plenty of examples. We don't have them diffused and institutionalized in our culture, civic culture. We have a corporate culture. We don't have a civic culture. Now here's another thing I did with my speech money. I hired some organizers at the peak of the electric utility rate. Remember in the 70s? And they were really driving people up the wall with high monthly utility bills. So we proposed this. Utilities are monopolies. That's a huge privilege, right? What do we get in return? Well, supposedly we get rate regulation. That's a joke. They control the regulators. So what do we get in return? So we said what we get in return, we want inside their envelopes. We want inside their billing envelopes. And we persuaded the legislature in Wisconsin and Illinois to pass a law saying that the electric, gas, and water utilities and telephone utilities a couple times a year have to put in this in their utility bill. So it starts out. Now you can do something about it. This is dear friend. It starts out. Since 1982, our electric bills in Illinois have jumped by more than $870 million. Gas bills, more than $250 million. Many telephone customers are still trying to figure out the new telephone company. One thing is sure, phone rates went up by more than $14 million in 1982, and most pay phones are now 25 cents. This is 1982. So they say, so they lay the predicate. They get your attention. You open the bill, and out falls this thing. Now, this is your peak point of interest, isn't it, when you get the bill? Ah! Right? And this falls out. It says, wait until you see your gas bill and your water bill and your electric bill. And you say, yeah, it's right here. Okay? And then you say, now you can do something about it. You can join the citizen, the consumer utility board, CUB, C-U-B. What does it mean? Well, you fill it out here. We'll put this on some bulletin board for you to look at it. Its name, address, phone number. Enclosed is $25, $15, $10, $5, other. I know of others who want to join CUB, send information to a friend, a relative, etc. The issues I'm concerned about, electric bills, gas bills, water bills, utility taxes, energy conservation, low-income heating assistance. I check off. I want to volunteer to help contact others. Nuclear power plants. Now watch. This is, you remember when I talked about facilities? That you can have rights and remedies, like you can sue. This is the, this is the facility that makes it easy for people to band together. So what was the result? 90,000 people in Wisconsin joined. That is a big consumer group. I mean, let me tell you. That is, in one state. Illinois, in 18 months, 180,000 consumers joined. They hired accountants, economists, consultants, lawyers, pub publicists. And in one negotiation with Commonwealth Edison, in 1993, they caught Commonwealth Edison overcharging millions of people in northern Illinois paying for excess capacity in their nuclear plants. You're supposed to be required to pay for some capacity in case you get a high peak load in a hot day or a cold day. But they charged the customers for more than the permissible excess of capacity. Now, most consumers wouldn't even know what the hell was going on, right? But they had their expert champions, and they caught them. And without even suing, they got a $1.3 billion refund, and Commonwealth Edison stopped doing it in a negotiation. So we were ready to go nationwide. Hey, you know, people in Alabama, they don't like to be ripped off any more than people in Massachusetts, regardless, conservative, liberal, evangelical, Unitarian, forget it. 
They're all consumers in this role. They want to hold on to their money. This also went to San Diego. They got 50,000 people in San Diego hated the utility so much. 50,000 people. We're looking at a 37% one jump there you in are. January. Okay, this applies. This is when you want to go to the legislature. This is a to-do to -do moment. This is to know and not to do is not to know. But here's what happened. In the most amazing thing, Pacific Gas and Electric took the consumer group to court. They lost at the trial level. Pacific Gas lost at the Supreme Court level of California. They took it to the Supreme Court of the United States. In the most devastating blow in the history of the consumer movement, 5-3 decision, with Lewis Powell in the majority, a former utility lawyer from Richmond, Virginia. Listen to the conclusion. You want to talk about cor corporate personhood? This is the most extreme elaboration of giving corporations the rights of human beings. Here's what they said. 5-3. The dissenter was William Rehnquist. Mr. Conservative ripped it apart, the majority opinion. But he was a minority. 5-3 decision. They said Pacific Gas and Electric had a First Amendment right to exclude the no expense to itself insertion. There was no extra postage, and the consumer group paid for the insert. They had the right to exclude the envelope from their billing because if they were forced to do so, they would be deprived, catch this, of their First Amendment right to remain silent and not rebut this message. See that? See what happens when corporations are treated like people. Uh, corporations have privileges and immunities that you'll never have, even if you're a billionaire. They can create their own parents. They can have subsidiaries everywhere. They can amass power like you could never dream of, threatening to go abroad, bringing legislators to their knees. They can go bankrupt and still get paid retention bonuses at the top. <clears throat> It's a double standard. It's Pacific Gas and Electric, 1986. Is this part of a re one reason why many utilities services now want to move to online billing and no paper bill? It would have been if this spread everywhere. But you can do this online, too. You can require a company, when they send you their bill online, to have this at ah. attached. Not quite the same, I don't think. But, okay. but I want to finish the story. <clears throat> this was a, a, an enormous blow. You know, the, the Supreme Court is final because it's supreme. And it's supreme because it's final, <laughs> short of a, an amendment or a subsequent reversal. This is where we failed. We did not bring a case up when the Supreme Court, when Rehnquist was, became Chief Justice, because we couldn't get any legislator to pass the bill. Why? Because they said the Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional, but we want to change it. They wouldn't buy it. So what happened? Well, Wisconsin Cub eventually shut down. Illinois Cub was more resourceful. This is what I mean by creative resiliency. They said, okay, we can't get this in the utility company's envelope. We'll go to the Illinois legislature, and we get a law that says it's going to go into your motor vehicle registration envelope. It's going to go into your government envelopes that are sent to you. Any government mailing, over 50,000 in number, they can put this in. So they survived, and they're still operating. See what I mean? I mean, Wisconsin gave it up. Illinois maneuvered and lived to work another day. At the time, we wanted this to go into banks, the bank statement, utility statement, big, big landlord-tenant, you know, bills, insurance. It would have revolutionized the country. It would have tipped the balance of power back more in the hands of these powerful 
million dollar million membership groups. I mean, you know, it's not just their technical expertise in, in the legislative hearing. They're sitting there, and the politicians know that there are 200,000 dues-paying members around the state. One decision blocked it. Had we had more, say, resources and so on, we might have tried more city councils, because any case going up would have been, it didn't have to be a, a legislative state letter, it could have been a city council. But the utilities would spread the word. They'd go to the city council, they'd go to the legislature, they say, don't consider this bill, it's trying to do something that the Supreme Court said is unconstitutional. You can't require a company, even if it's a monopoly. But you see, the argument for it was reciprocity. What are we getting for this monopoly? What are we getting for protecting this monopoly from competition? The cardinal basis of the American economic system, so-called. We don't demand anything in return. What are we getting for all these tax breaks we give ExxonMobil and the oil and gas coal industry? We're getting higher prices. What are we getting in return? The demand for reciprocity. You have taxpayers being forced to build stadiums and ballparks, right? All over the country. You want to talk about a left-right coalition? That comes in real high. Let these sports capitalists behave like capitalists, one right-winger told me. They don't have to freeload on my back. All right, so they are built. When Jerry Brown was mayor of Oakland, he told me the Oakland Stadium for the football team had to be subsidized $20 million, $21 million a year from this poor city. They had to subsidize it. It was part of the contract. What are people getting in return? They're getting high ticket prices, high hot dog prices, high rental prices, and you hardly see a minority face. A lousy team, too. Yeah. <laughs> you can't carry your own food and beverages in either. Yeah, you're getting all of that. You see, it starts with power concedes nothing without a demand. We've got to memorize some of these historic pieces of wisdom. Power concedes nothing without a demand. You go up to a politician who voted to tax, tax built stadium, and you say to the politician who's asking for your vote, hey, you voted for this stadium. You voted for my taxes for this stadium. Yeah, it was good for jobs. Oh, really good for jobs? It's only open nine days a year. There are only nine games a year. And they're low-paid jobs, selling Coke or hot dogs. Well, you know, it's, it's excitement. It, it's a destination. It brings people. They go to restaurants. He said, you know, you know, Mr. Politician, I was born at night. But I wasn't born last night. <laughs> okay? I'm going to ask you a question. What did we get in return for that? Did we get a cut in the budget for neighborhood recreational facilities for kids to get them off the street and have them exercise their bodies with their parents? Did we get that? Or do we pour it all in for this billion dollar monster? Well, You'll be pleased to know that we, we defeated one cold turkey in Connecticut. You remember when the Boston Patriots, some of you may remember, went to Hartford. They wanted a free stadium in Boston. They went to Hartford and dangled it. Hartford went nuts. The legislature, wine, dine, get it through, half a billion dollars. And then they up it. Mr. Kraft said, well, how about a practice field? All right, it's another 50 million, 100 million, 500 million, you know, let's go. What else do you need? He was about to ask him for the uniforms. All right, so it was going to be built on the banks of the Connecticut River. The programs broke the news on Connecticut TV. It was so exciting. They were doing, you know, the Oprah Winfrey show. Uh, attention, attention. The Patriots are coming to Hartford. The polls showed 70% support. We were opposing it. 
I said, okay. So we sat down with some right-wing taxpayer groups, and we had some environmental groups because there was stuff underneath the land, um, contamination that they were going to build the plant, the uh, stadium on. And we did a left-right coalition. And the protest started. And the disclosure of how bad a deal started. And the padding of campaign contribution exposure started. In six months, Mr. Kraft came to Hartford, had a press conference, and said, sorry, folks, we're out of here. We're going back to Boston, where he actually built his own stadium. He got infrastructure support, you know, feeder roads, but he paid for his own stadium with private money. How many people do you think were involved in that actively? You could put them in this room. You could put them in half of this room. What did they have going for them? The power of information and public opinion that this is a bad deal that they lied to us, they kept information from us, they deceived us, and there's a better way to spend taxpayer money if you're going to spend it on sports. It's called My Neighborhood Park, My Neighborhood Children's Jumping Equipment. That's how it was done. Well, we're battling that right now again in Hartford, Rob. Pardon? At Hartford, is right back there again now with the Rockcat Stadium. Yes, they now want to take from New Britain. From New Britain yeah, from New Britain to Hartford. Whether they'll get a critical mass of a couple dozen people. Uh, yeah, they never stop, do they? The one thing about corporations is they have an incredible repetitive syndrome. Uh, unless you, unless you, you, unless you change the structure of accountability, which we will talk about uh, shortly. Now, l l let me just uh, go through. I want to just, as a preliminary, go through this. Um, n nobody's ever written a book like this, even though it should have been written years ago, because we're all stuck writing books against one another where we disagree, left, right. Thousands of books on abortion, anti-abortion. Thousands of books on school prayer, on balanced budget, right? That's where it all is. If you were ruling a country and on behalf of a few people, you would want to divide and rule. So they hate each other so much when you say, you know, you agree on a lot of things. They sort of engage in a suspicious pause. So I learned that Grover Norquist agrees with me on, against corporate welfare. He's a terrible person on tax. He's a terrible person on unions. But he's a very good opponent of corporate welfare. That's not where his money comes from, so he doesn't spend day after day against it. But I went to John Kasich, who's now governor of Ohio, just reelected. He's going to go for the presidency. He was head of the House Budget Committee, and he was a Republican and a big supporter of Newt Gingrich. And I read in the paper that he once made a critical comment that the Pentagon budget was too big. <gasps> I mean, the Republicans went nuts, you know, the, the leadership. How do you, how do you say this? The Pentagon budget defending America? He said, well, look, we know and you know that that's the case. You're... GAO has documented it from A to Z, report after report. Cost overruns, corruption, weapon systems are redundant, weapon systems are defective, and they still are pushed like the helicopter version, and so on. Uh, what happened to John Kasich is, on corporate welfare, he stopped censoring himself. Now, this is a very, very important thing. Without self-censorship, you don't get censorship. Self-censorship is the mother and father of censorship. Everyone you'll ever meet censors themselves. You can't get through life if you don't somehow censor yourself and not say what 
you believe. Someone comes up to you, you've got a gastrointestinal pain. How are you today? Fine. Okay? We all, we all saw. However, there are degrees, right? And when it becomes a way of life for people in leadership positions, for people in civic positions, for ordinary people who just go through life censoring themselves because societies are full of taboos. Things that are taken off the table are quasi-taboos, like single-payer. That was a taboo for Obama, even though he believed in it. It was a taboo for the Republicans, who didn't believe in it. But they didn't want it in Congress to be heard. They didn't want it in the visits to the White House before Obamacare was arrived at. They were frozen out, the single-payer, including a very close friend of Obama's uh, in Chicago. What's his name? Yeah, Quentin Young. Well, he started Physicians for Social Response, Physicians for a National Health uh, Healthcare Plan, NPH Physicians, whatever it stands for. 15,000 physicians belong to them. Majority of physicians want single payer because they want to practice medicine, not bookkeeping. A majority of physicians now are, are employed. They've lost their professional independence. They're employed by hospitals, large cardi cardiology practices, and, and, and so on. So I went to Kasich and I said, how about the first hearing in American congressional history on corporate welfare? And it took a while, you know, back and forth. And he said, okay, I'll give you four hours for our hearing. And he, and he said, who do you recommend to testify? I said, right, left. I want people who are conservative, people who are liberal. We got Bob McIntyre of Citizens for Tax Justice. If you ever want anything about tax reform, that's the number one group to go to in Washington. Citizens for Tax Justice. They have an excellent newsletter online. They'll tell you the top 25 profitable corporations who paid no income tax and federal income tax. And, uh, very, very well respected for accuracy and analytic depth. So we got him testifying, and we got Grover Norquist. So I'm in the middle. And... We disagree. Grover Norquist does not think tax breaks are corporate welfare. So that was taken away from our consensus. But a lot of other things worth tens of billions of dollars were. So we had a nice hearing. It's printed. Probably can get it online. I think it was 1998. Yeah, something like that. But nothing happened. It's really interesting. Why didn't anything happen? You had the Heritage Foundation with reports against corporate welfare. You had Cato Foundation with reports against corporate welfare. You had the Progressive Policy Institute uh, with reports. You had Common Cause with reports against corporate welfare. You had Public Citizen with reports about against corporate welfare. Why didn't anything happen? Why didn't it coalesce into a bill? Why didn't it go for a vote at the committee? and then go to the floor. Because for all these groups, corporate welfare was secondary to all the other missions, reform missions, for which they got grants. Very few of them get grants to fight corporate welfare. Foundations just are not into it. If you look at their boards, you might understand why. So they all went to work, and they were fighting each other on issues that were fundable. And so that's one of the obstacles dealt with in this book. How do you deal with that? I did not sugarcoat, sugarcoat the obstacles. You deal with it by starting groups that only deal with left-right converging issues. That's all they deal with. That's what they go to work for in the morning. They have no conflict of priorities. And that's why I have a chapter, Dear Billionaire. People are accusing me of searching for billionaires. <laughs> we have hundreds of billionaires. All you need are two or one. This is low-budget stuff. All you need, two or one. I mean, Tom Steyer, you just $65 million for the elections. All you need are about 10 groups with a couple million-dollar budgets each, and you're underway. Why? 
because it already exists out there in people's minds. Left, right, convergence. I'll give you the list. You think there's a left, right convergence that the military budget should be audited. Are you kidding? $800 billion a year, it's unaudited. The General Accounting Office of Congress comes back every year and says, the Pentagon doesn't have its accounting detail available so we can audit it. The biggest budget in the United States, unaudible. And that's why the first few months of the Iraq War, $9 billion disappeared. Billion. Where'd it go? Where are the auditors? That comes in about 90%. Support. Once you get an audit, a lot of things follow, obviously. You uncover a lot of waste and corruption. Second, establish rigorous procedures to evaluate the claims of businesses demanding and getting corporate welfare. They now get it by pushing it through Congress, and then every year it's automatic. It's not reviewed. Hey, did, did we get anything from this subsidy? Are the number of jobs promised for the subsidy? Not reviewed. Third, promote efficiency in government contracting and government spending. That is, one way is you put all government contracts, grants, and leaseholds online. All the texts. We have a, we got an amendment through Congress where the summaries of all government contracts have to be put online. That's not good enough. That's a plus, but it's not good enough. We want to get the full text. What happens? You start having reporters have the contract beat. You start having scholars showing where these contracts are too one-sided, they're unfair, and they produce inefficiency, and they induce corruption, and they don't produce adequate products and services. You have taxpayer groups making an issue in the election, and you have smaller businesses who say, I can do it better. This is not a contract. I would ever demand the government to sign with me. I can do the same thing for half the price. Now we have Senator Coburn and Senator Obama, when he was senator, signed on to a bill to do that. Full text. It didn't go any further. Why? There wasn't a group in Washington, a citizen group, going up there day after day, bringing him together, you know, bringing more people in the House, Senate, and so forth. Sometimes it happens up there without any effort. Ron Paul and Barney Frank, believe it or not, got together in 2010 and, and started a staffed uh, caucus to go after the bloated military budget. Can you imagine two unlikely people? Ron Paul and Barney Frank. But they needed more. They needed more people on both sides. So, it's, but it's there. I mean, if you ask most members of Congress, even ones you wouldn't have lunch with, do they want the Pentagon audited? Almost all of them would say yes. But they get money from Lockheed Martin and Drummond and Grummond and, and uh, uh, you know, Groton, the boat, con the boat company and nuclear subs and so on. If you ask people, do you want full government tax? Yeah, we do, but we got other things we're busy with. Why don't you have? Why don't you go see another senator or representative? Another one is breaking up too big to fail banks. That comes in 90 percent. Tougher corporate crime enforcement with adequate budgets, which are ridiculously small. The analogy I use: picture a major street crime wave in New York City, and there's only 100 police. What would people say? We need more patrols. We need more community policing. People have to be protected. We have very few federal cops on the corporate crime beat by design. This is where the lobbyists, in a stealth matter, work on the appropriations authorization committees. And it's never given any media publicity. They go up there and they say, I don't think you should increase the EPA budget, even though you've increased their duties. Keep it tight. To show you what the budget battle is like, EPA's budget is $10, 10 billion a year. Just think of air, water, soil, dams, food contamination, vehicle fuel efficiency, $10 billion. 
the lobbies, the military lobbies, have got a $10 million or a $9 million budget on the biggest boondoggle in the Defense Department. It's called missile defense against ballistic missiles. We're not talking about crude garage-built rockets out of Gaza. Those are easily dealt with, although the, the score rate was exaggerated. You go to MIT, you got Professor Ted Postal. He's the world's expert on missile defense, and he will tell you it's a complete boondoggle by the principles of physics. It can't work. It's too easy to decoy with balloons, etc. And besides, there are other ways to sneak in a nuclear weapon into the United States than a ballistic missile, which would, of course, demonstrate its origin, and its origin would be incinerated in a counterattack. Nine and a half billion dollars a year to keep Raytheon going and other companies <clears throat> in this make work of, of corporate welfare. Attacking, allowing taxpayers standing to sue. Here's another thing. Why is it that we can't sue government for wasteful programs? Because there's a long standing doctrine that you don't have standing to even bring the suit and get a day in court because you don't have a specific interest, a specific economic interest. And this is such a wild doctrine of exclusion. They've even excluded businesses who say, we do have a specific economic interest. You're wasting money with a competitor contract, and we could save you money. If we took you to court, we could get you to stop doing this. Even that has not worked. This is one way the judiciary has copped out. The judiciary loves to escape responsibility, only exceeded by the level that Congress wants to escape responsibility and give it all to the executive branch, like the war-making power. What do you think that comes into? Huge. Once you explain it to people, you're shot out of court as a taxpayer. All the corruption you read about, you can't do anything about it. You can't go to court. You're shut out. You can't go to court like a civil rights, uh, someone whose civil rights have been violated. You can't go to court as someone who's hurt by a defective product, and you can go to court in product liability. You can't go to court. They just, the judge says, dismissed. You want to go to court to challenge a criminal war of aggression. You can show it was not declared by Congress, the Iraq War. They have another doctrine the courts, for escaping responsibility. They say that's a political question to be decided between Congress and the presidency. It's not for us to decide. So they have two doctrines that shut you out. Standing to sue, political doctrine. What do you think about that for a left-right coalition? What conservative would oppose that? Community self-reliance. Community businesses displacing multinational sales, banks, oil companies, big food processes, agribusiness, health companies, so-called drug companies. You think conservatives don't like farmer markets? I'm a conservative. I want to buy from Safeway. I like processed food full of coloring additives for the kiddies. I don't want fresh food that tastes better and better for me because I'm a conservative. I'm against farmer consumer markets. I'm against community health clinics and emphasized prevention. I'm against local renewable energy. Uh, I, I want to be, I want to have my strings pulled by multinational corporations in Tokyo or Chicago or New York. Absentee ownership. Nonsense. Clear away obstacles to a competitive electoral process. You have left-right support for third parties, libertarian, conservative parties, green parties, independent parties. Left-right. The polls come in, 65% of the American people want a viable third party. That doesn't mean they're going to vote for it. Something else kicks in. What kicks in is the hereditary voter. That has to be overcome. However, they do say yes when they're asked. They want more voices and choices on the ballot. They're tired of one party dominance or another party dominance 
in 90% of the elections. Slam dunk. You know, gerrymandering. Depending on who runs the state government, Republican or Democrat. Texas, for example, is heavily gerrymandered to reduce the impact of the black and Hispanic vote, which is growing. Hispanic, vo Hispanic population is over 30%. But the way they gerrymander it, they can actually come up with terrible candidates uh, winning easily in congressional districts. How about this one? Patriot Act. This one is the Patriot Act says, in effect, they can search your home and not tell you for 72 hours. Whoa. Whoa. I mean, I think those are the most important hours, wouldn't you say? <laughs> 72 hours? Yeah, who cares? Well, we'll tell you for the next 10 years, but not the first 72 hours. Huh? And also librarians. They can send a librarian to jail who tells you that, that the librarian got a national security letter from the FBI to look into what you've loaned out in books and DVDs. If they notify you, uh, they, they can be criminally prosecuted. So you have a left right saying, this is, out, this is out of order. This is crazy. The Patriot Act is going to be renewed next year. Okay. It'll probably be passed. It was renewed twice by acclamation. Because although there's a left-right coalition in people's minds, here's the key point. It hasn't gone operational. Left-right uh, has gone operational on minimum wage in cities and states that are passing. It'll go operational in Congress soon. Left-right has gone operational in state legislatures, 15 of them in juvenile justice reform reducing draconian sentences for a little bit of marijuana or cocaine possession. That passed only because liberal and conservative legislators got together. Left-right went up operational for the Freedom of Information Act 1974. It went operational for the Auto Safety Act, which passed unanimously in the House of Representatives, 1966. It went operational for the False Claims Act of 1986. The ability for you to detect, even if you're an employee of a company, you detect the company's ripping off the government in a contract, and you blow the whistle, and the Justice Department takes the case, they can give you as much as 20% of the recovery. So there have been some whistleblowers, after going through hell, becoming multimillionaires. Now that was tremendously opposed by corporate lobbies on Capitol Hill. Left, right, one. That's why I called unstoppable. Cannot stop left-right coalition. Not all left, not all right, but enough for a very significant majority of people. I learned this when we were fighting the Clinch River Breeder Reactor in Tennessee. Anybody remember that fight? This was a, a government <coughs> subsidized program, and it was started out, it was going to cost a billion and a half dollars. Before they even broke ground, there were government estimates that would go to five to eight billion. So it was a boondoggle. On the Clinch River, it was supposed to produce the energy consumed, breeder, reactor. It was a plutonium threat in terms of proliferation. So the left was against it. They weren't getting anywhere in Congress. We weren't getting anywhere. And so Senator Bumpers called us up. He said, why don't you get together with the Center for Competitive Enterprise and National Taxpayers Union, right wing groups, so we, we overcame the yuck factor. And we got together in a room, and we started, we gave them the title, Taxpayers' Responsibility, you know, to stop the, the Clinch River. Hey, there was a taxpayer problem, obviously. And uh, Westinghouse, General Electric, and Ronald Reagan were against us. The press was more on the side of the breeder reactor. It was phoning it up to be a savior for the energy crisis. The vote occurred in the Senate. We beat them 56 to 40. End of project. Now, already in the sense of fairness, if you polled the American people, as this thing shouldn't get off the ground. They want to build it, let GE, let, they're big companies, let them build it. This is going huge tax, huge cost overruns. But there was no such poll. But the legislators knew that, that, that if people were asked about that, 
they would want to close it down, a majority. Did that Senate vote on party lines? No. No, it included both sides. It defeated Senator Howard Baker. He was from Tennessee, he was a real power. He, he really couldn't control all his votes. So, now check this out. It got publicity and it helped fuel the False Claims Act, as I mentioned, of 1986, this left-right. But it didn't lead to the creation of citizen advocacy groups, only focusing on convergence. Because there, there's so many things they've got to pay attention to, put out brush fires every day, get grants for this and that, and they're all important. That's the big hurdle we've got to overcome is to get these institutions set up. Single payer has been supported by majority of the American people since Harry Truman. Without any promotion, really, other than the example of Medicare. In other words, all the promotion is on the side of the other guys. Socialized medicine, you know, it ain't gonna work, it's inefficient, it's wasteful. You say, what about Canada? They cover everybody for half the price per capita, $4,400 instead of over 9,000. In this country, we've got 40 million uncovered. Well, you know, that's, uh, that's socialism. <laughs> well, we know how to, I'm sure everybody in this room knows how to deal with that. You, socialism, you mean public libraries? Public schools? Yosemite National Park, a bastion of evil socialism? How about corporate socialism? Then you get them on the corporate welfare bit. Protecting children from commercialism and its physical and mental exploitation and harm. This is a huge left right that has not gone operational. We have delivered our children to corporate electronic child molesters. If you look at what they are doing, bypassing and undermining parental authority and direct marketing in billions of dollars of ads to kids. They are selling them junk food, junk drink, how to harass their own parents, nag their own parents if they don't have the money for it, and violent, disgusting, sadistic programming. Teaching them how to tear limbs from bad guys now. You have interacta, interactive, and the video games are sadomasochistic vicious toward women. We have allowed our children to be delivered into the hands of these corrupt marketers. And what are the, what's the result? There is a transfer result in terms of their behavior. They are getting overweight. They are getting early diabetes. They are getting early signs of high blood pressure. They are learning how to be spectators instead of participants in their local sports. They are learning about violence as a solution to problems, even if it's good guy violence, it's violence. They are learning all the wrong things. And you say, what an upside down society we live in. That we have the votes and we have the power and the Constitution starts with we the people, not we the corporations. Corporation isn't even mentioned. The word corporation and company or political party isn't even mentioned in the Constitution. Why are we ruled by them? See? So we have allowed the commercialization of childhood, undermining and circumventing parental authority. Now, I made this presentation before the most clenched jaw evangelical right wing audience you could stand in front of. Okay? And I got a standing ovation. And they knew where I was coming from on other issues. They, thought they do not like me on. They knew that. That's a left right coalition which, if it can be funded, will go operational very rapidly. Now, there are civil liberties issues. You know, what, okay, what are you going to do? Censor television? Well, first of all, let's counteract it with television. Let's have programs that rip the, the shit out of these people, right? 
The answer to bad free speech is more free speech. When you see kids being induced to buy hot dogs that are 30% fat, miscellaneous percentages of coloring additives, chemical additives, restorative additives, miscellaneous debris, low protein content. Do you ever see an ad attacking hot dogs? Okay. When you see all the ads pushing cars and highways, you see all these car ads? You can't turn a program on without ah, the new turbocharged Nissan and so on, right? Have you ever seen ads promoting mass transit? Have you ever seen ads promoting modern public transit? Not just rickety buses and old trains. So that's one thing we can do because we own the property. It's our public airways. Now I gave you audience network. You have that one sheet. I don't know if you read that. But that was a proposal I dropped on Congress. And Ed Markey was the committee subchair and he had the first hearing. And he never went further. I testified that since people own the public airways, we should not give it away 24-7 to radio and TV stations free. What business gives away its property free? We should charge them through the Federal Communications Commission. When they license, you say, okay, you pay how much for your auto license here? What do you pay? Okay, well, the biggest station in Boston pays nothing for its FCC license to mint money. All right, so, so we, we said that. And we said, also, we should have a couple hours a day back for the audience network. We have our own reporters, our own studios, our own producers. Uh, we have skilled people, but we also learn ourselves. And we program, local and national, what we want to hear. And so we had this hearing. You will not believe how he, how he conducted it. Half, he had 10, pe he had ten people. Five of them were broadcast lobbyists who didn't quite know how to attack our position. How, what could they say? You're confiscating your own property? <laughs> you see, we got under their usual propaganda, which is free speech. You say, so they started. They, are, they want legislative restrictions on free speech. I looked at them. I said, oh, no. We just want to take back some of our property. Have any objections to that? Now, you can continue doing what you're doing, but we're going to have a couple hours a day, and uh, we're going to give you a dose of free speech. <laughs> now, on my side were five chairs. You will not believe who testified with me. I'll give you three guesses. She was very prominent, and she was on the Phil Donahue show ten times. Phyllis Shafley. Now, you want to talk about a yuck factor? <laughs> I mean, I believe she was honest in her positions. I don't think anybody was paying her. And she's very articulate. But she would not be the first person you would think of to ally yourself. But that's what caught the fancy of the press. It gave them an easy lead. Unlikely people today testified before Senator Ed Markey. Who's Phyllis? Phyllis Shafley was the arch opponent of the women's uh, liberation right. movement. Right. Women's equal. She was against the Equal Rights Amendment. A single-handed weapon of mass destruction. Let me tell you. <laughs> I mean, you, you really have to hand it to her in terms of her energy. She's 90, over 90 now and in, in living in Missouri. I'm not saying, by the way, she was 100% wrong. The reason why she got so much credibility is because she showed that the feminists didn't tie in to home workers. People, who, you know, people who raise kids, they, they look down on them. And she, she had the majority on these issues that, you know, blue-collar women who stayed home to raise kids or weren't fancy stylists uh, like a lot of the feminist leaders she said, you're disrespecting us. This is important work, staying home, raising children. Well, she had a lot of people, obviously, agreeing with her on that. Um, but she went way overboard. Uh, but it's, a, it, it's an interesting thing that she made the same argument I made. She said, 
I, I want some of my property back. I want time back. I'm not going to put the programs that Mr. Nader is going to put on necessarily. Okay, well, so what? So what? You remember Anthony Lewis, his last book? You remember Anthony Lewis for the New York Times? The last book he wrote was In Defense of the Speech You Hate. See, if you really believe in the First Amendment, you will defend the speech of people who vigorously disagree with you. That's the test. That's why Donahue was such a giant in American media history, because he put on people 30 times he put on Falwell. 30, 30 programs. You couldn't have someone disagree with you more, right? That's how much he believed in the First Amendment. And uh, he's a historic figure. Nobody's done him justice yet. At any rate, controlling more of the commons that we already own. Why should we sell 300-foot spruce trees for 10 bucks? That's what they were going for in the 1970s in the Tongass National Forest in Alaska. The price of a cheeseburger or two. Huge. Cut. Private timber companies. And guess what? We have to build the roads for them in the forest. Controlling more of what we own. The Commonwealth. That's why I hope David Bollier, who lives in Amherst and is one of the leaders of the commons movement, comes up here for a weekend sometime, if you get a mailing, even though he's not nationally known, uh, he has a great uh, DVD on the commons, he's had international symposiums, uh, he's written books, his latest book is Think Like a Commoner, you know, the commons. So we own the commons, we don't control it. Who controls the corporations? And I'll give you my favorite example. 20 years ago, the Canadian gold company, Barrick, it's a big one, B-A-R-R-I-C-K, perfectly legally went on federal land in Nevada with their prospectors and geologists and discovered, by their own estimate, $9 billion worth of gold. B, under the 1872 Mining Act, still on the books, they went to Washington. They told them they wanted X number of acres to buy over the mine. And the price for $9 billion of gold was $20,000. That's our gold. And there were no royalties back to the Department of Interior from the profits. And when they exhaust the mine and they leave cyanide-laced waste, guess who picks up the bill? The taxpayer. So all hard rock minerals, molybdenum, Gold, silver, all hard rock minerals come under the 1872 Mining Act where any company, foreign or domestic, discovering hard rock minerals on federal land can get them for a maximum price of five bucks an acre. And no mine is ever more than 10,000 acres. That's 50,000 bucks. No, it could be an individual, but an individual never makes it because you've got to prove... That you, that you can mine it. So it's, and by the way, an individual would incorporate anyway. Now, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. By the way, if you don't think that's a left right alliance, whew, you're giving away my gold, the conservative says, you know, my gold. Okay, here's what I want to do. How do you, yeah, we're about to break for lunch. How do you move from cognitive understanding? That, that is, they understand the 1872, they understand the facts. Talking about mass people. How do you move what they have here? They finally understood what's going on. You know, you don't grow up learning about the 1872 Mining Act even in law school, unless you take a mining seminar in Colorado. How do you move them to emotional intelligence? How do you move them from cognitive reality to fire in the belly? That's what breaks routine. That's what breaks your daily routine. That's what tells you you've got to spend more time on this. That's what tells you you've got to have different priorities in your daily life. Emotional intelligence. And we'll show, when you come back, show you an excerpt from a DVD on Iraq, which has symbolized the greatest foreign policy tragedy in the world, in our country, because of how it's metastasized over large parts of the world. 
and how it's affected our company, our country, from civil liberties to the allocation of public budgets and repair of public works and all the other things they tell us we don't have money for that could create well-paying jobs in every community that cannot be exported to China or Mexico. So we'll come, and at 1.30 I'll be out there. If you want to personalize any of these books for your friends or you have someone in college or high school, I'd be happy uh, to do that as well. You have to sign a lot of $2 bills. <laughs> I don't sign legal tender, by the way. Okay. Thank you very much.